<coughs> Could I welcome uh, Minister Alistair Burt and Ms. Clement Shaw. Thank you very much for coming to the committee this afternoon. Happy New Year. And uh, very, very good to see you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if I may, we're going to go straight into questions, and I'm going to invite uh, Nadim Zahawi to kick off. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Minister. Welcome, Amy Clement Shaw. Uh, welcome to, and congratulations, Minister, for being reappointed. Thank you very much. To your role. Um, the UK has provided significant military and uh, political <laughs> support to the Iraqi Kurds, uh, especially after 1991. Uh, and of course, including and during the war against Daesh. Um, was this support to uphold our values, UK values, um, to protect our interests, UK interests, or both? Um, th th thank you, Chairman, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Zahawi, uh, uh, for the question. Um, I appreciate the chance to, to come here. Uh, most of what you're going to ask me is within my portfolio area. One or two things are slightly outside, and if I do need to get information from behind me, I hope you'll forgive me if I do, because I'd rather put the right information before the committee than try and bluff you. Uh, I can't bluff this committee, uh, so I, I won't do that. But thank you for giving us a welcome and this opportunity. Um, uh, Mr Zahawi, it, it's a mixture, really. Uh, the relationship with the... The uh, Kurdish community in, uh, in northern Iraq goes back a long time. I mean, within my own political lifetime and memory, uh, John Major's work uh, in providing the, the, the cover uh, for them uh, and protection uh, those many years ago, uh, the indignities and the atrocities suffered under Had uh, Saddam Hussein, has given us a, a long relationship with that Kurdish community. Um, the, the, the Kurdish regional area shares our values, uh, a belief in democracy, tolerance of liberal values, diversity, preventing extremism. So there are good reasons why we have a, a long relationship. And in recent times, that fight against Daesh has uh, amplified all of these, uh, giving us something which we shared in common, uh, which we needed to resist. Uh, they were in the front line uh, in relation to that resistance. So if our common interest is the defeat of extremism and terrorism, uh, if it is seeking to encourage the very best of values uh, in a region, then I think these are absolutely mutual interests and it's quite hard to work out where ours stops and somebody else's begin in something like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you going to go? Um, Anne, if you were, you were wanting to come in. Uh, Yes, uh, Minister, mm -hmm. do you think there's been a tendency to idealise the Kurds, overlooking uh, matters such as factionalism and corruption? Well, it depends, it, it depends who you ask and how deeply you want to go into it. As far as the, uh, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is, is concerned and government in general, uh, then no. We are realistic. Uh, in terms of what's uh, what's happening there, um, it's tempting from the outside, of course, because we talk about the Kurdish people and the Kurds, to give a sense that this is a, a unified group of people uh, living in a region which crosses national boundaries, and therefore that there is a, a commonality uh, in all sorts of areas in terms of politics, values, uh, interests, etc. Whereas this committee will know, and I, I know a number on the committee know the community very well, um, nothing is ever that simple. Uh, so no, there's no sense of, uh, of idealism. Uh, these are people who have different interests, competing interests, uh, have uh, are on occasions of course come to war uh, with each other in terms of protecting their own interests. And it would be wrong for the UK government to idealise any, any group at all. So our relationship with them is realistic in that uh, I, I spoke earlier of the values that we share, where people move away from those values. You would expect the United Kingdom to be clear in its uh, advice uh, or on occasions uh, condemnation. Uh, and we have that relationship. So no, it's not looking at a way at anything that might be wrong, but recognising that in the main, the politicians with whom we have dealt over 20 years have in the main aspired uh, for the sort of things that we would wish to support uh, in terms of their uh, care for their people. Well, can I ask you about the recent suppression of uh, peaceful demonstration 
where I think about eight people were killed, other people were injured. The uh, only independent television channel owner was uh, captured and imprisoned. It's now been released. Um, the Foreign Office got any view on that? Well, um, firstly, recognising that uh, in recent in recent months and, and in the run-up to the referendum and certainly after the referendum, there's been a lot of information that's come out of the region and not all of it has been evidence-based and factually based and therefore there's a limit as to what the government can comment upon. Um, uh, and various sides are trying to get their point over on, on, on various things. But uh, and, and you're describing an internal situation. Uh, the United Kingdom has not, as far as I'm aware, expressed a view beyond uh, as we always do, supporting the right of peaceful protest within the law, uh, calling on all sides to make sure they avoid violence, and that any detention and ar arrests have to be within the law so that justice can be followed and followed transparently, and we would apply it to the circumstances that uh, you've just described. Was the Foreign Office aware of uh, what sparked off these uh, demonstrations? What, what, what were the issues that... Uh, got them uh, to go out on the streets? Um, uh, there's been different, different things that have sparked things, you know, particularly since the referendum. The referendum and the aftermath brought to the surface a number of tensions that I think had been, had been concealed in the process running up to the referendum because the referendum gave people a clear political focus point uh, covered up some things that were maybe underlying issues and tensions and to a certain extent that's all come uh, that's all come more out into the uh, into the open after the referendum and there's been different there have been confrontations between different factions but also there's been underlying economic pressures um, this is a region which uh, uh, has the opportunity through oil resources to be uh, to be a a more than viable economic unit, uh, liberal with its uh, economics and looking for expansion and looking for good relationships outside. But much depends on the relationship with Baghdad and the, uh, the finances and the budget. Recent financial constraints and I think the non-payment of wages uh, 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 has led to some of the concerns which sparked the recent protests on the streets uh, in, in the region. Uh, not unadjacent to other problems that have been seen across the border in other places. So it was economic pressures there. So it's a combination of economic and political issues in the area that can bring people out onto the streets in terms of conflict. That's why it's essential that the rule of law, that the UK is so keen on, on raising with people for the protection of whether it's minority groups or those protesting, is so important to, uh, to encourage in these areas. Could I just ask you about non-payment of wages? Yes. Are the, is the non-payment of wages by the KRG or the Iraqi government? Uh, I understand that in this particular instance it was related to it was related to KRG payments, but you're going into a very internal issue, and I'm, I'm not sure there's very much more I can I can add to it. Yeah, it's just I'm pressing on this because. Yes. The reasons for the demonstrations, I think, are important, and who's responsible, you know, for the non-payment of wages? Uh, it's either the KRG or it's Baghdad, or is it, is it both? Well, um, you of, of course you, you often get an expression of concern from KRG about the budget difficulties which they believe are sometimes caused by Baghdad. The non-payment of key revenues has been a long-running issue between the region and Baghdad uh, over many years and budgetary constraints can be put down either to difficulties in choices uh, that people make or an absence of funds coming in in the first place. Um, Amy, uh, on this particular issue. Nothing that I would have Minister. No, go on. I think that covers it. Um, as, as, as far as I'm aware, the, uh, the, the recent protests in Suleimania were protests against the regional government, against KRG, uh, and that's where I understand the, uh, the, the problems to have been directed towards. But uh, that's just one of the underlying tensions in the area. Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. 
Um, clearly, the um, people of Iraq <coughs> and, and the people of Kurdistan region of Iraq have been great friends and allies to the United Kingdom uh, in recent years. So <coughs> we owe them a great deal. But the Iraqi contributors to our inquiry, some have actually expressed the view that over this issue of the independence referendum, they feel that the UK has rather let them down. In fact, uh, one described as feeling betrayed by the UK's government, UK government's attitude towards that referendum. Could you clarify um, once and for all, is the UK opposed to independence for Iraqi Kurdistan as a matter of principle, or is it just a question of timing and method? Uh, we made clear to the, uh, the, the KRG that a unilateral <coughs> referendum in relation to independence we did not believe was in the interests of Iraq, of stability and of the continuing fight against Daesh. Um, uh, and, and we said consistently that any process that was to lead to uh, referendum and possible independence had to be part of, a, uh, of an agreement with Iraq. We stand for a uh, strong, stable, unified Iraq able to stand up for its own interest in the region not divided along sectarian lines. And in relation to the referendum, we formed a view very early that we did not believe it was in the interests of the region uh, or those who were advocating it uh, in order to press it. Um, uh, and we gave this advice consistently, and as the committee will know, we weren't alone in relation to this. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a view in relation to independence. If there is ultimately movements for independence in the area, this must be settled by people in the region, it won't be settled by the United Kingdom. But again, as the committee will know, the, the, the different Kurdish groups operating within the area, between Turkey, Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq, all sorts of issues have been raised for decades, as we know. Um, so we're clear that if these issues are to be followed by, if these issues are to work towards independence, this can only be done through political agreement and consent. And we didn't believe that a, a unilateral referendum was likely to produce the, uh, the, the answer. We were consistent in relation to that. Uh, we don't feel it's a matter of betrayal by the United Kingdom to offer honest advice, and we don't think it's a matter of betrayal of the United Kingdom if we simply disagree with those who take a contrary view, no matter how deeply or passionately they hold it. And we weren't alone in the views that we held. So it's not a matter of principle. Ultimately, if there can be some agreement, then you're not objecting to it in principle. It's about it being done in the context of a stable Iraq and by consent of the people? If there, if, if there is ultimate agreement by the government of Iraq about an independent Kurdish region, that is a matter for Iraq and the Kurdish and the Iraqi people. And have you uh, clearly communicated that this view to the Iraqi Kurds, some of whom have actually said to this committee that they saw the UK's policies as a tacit endorsement to a path towards independence? Um, uh, I think we've been very clear. We've certainly been clear in my time when the uh, when the referendum came up. I went. Uh, I worked with uh, Frank Baker, our ambassador there at the time. We worked with other ambassadors. I don't think there could have been anything clearer from the United Kingdom over a period of time than to say that politically the aspirations of the Kurdish people uh, are are not going to be met unless it is done by agreement. Uh, and within the constitutional processes which the, um, uh, which the Iraqi constitution allows. And right up at the very end, when there was the possibility of a negotiated agreement between the two sides, which uh, left open the, uh, all the options for the future, and I, I know this was the case, that was a course which the, um, uh, President Bazani didn't feel he was able to take. But I'm, I'm quite sure that we were very clear uh, in our views in relation to this, and this would be known by those with whom we were dealing. Okay. Some of the uh, Kurdish witnesses have said that the referendum was not about achieving independence, but at least not for the time being, and they described it as a bargaining tactic through which the Kurds sought to leverage to negotiate with Baghdad over internal matters. 
Have you come across this particular oh, yeah. view? And yes. Do you agree that that was the real intention of the referendum? Um, I think, I think what, what I said in relation to that argument was that um, these things have unexpected consequences. And just because one side believes, oh, it's here to flag up an intention, it's to improve bargaining position, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else saw it in the same way. Um, a referendum is a referendum. It means what it says. And we again advised the, the, the KRG that just because they saw it as a bargaining chip did not necessarily mean that that was how it was seen in Baghdad by those who may not take the same benevolent view as, as we would want to take towards people's aspirations. And we warned of consequences. Um, and also, once, once the referendum had taken place and the result was there, uh, no one can quite control what then happens, as has been seen. We had our concerns, and we think that advice has been, has been proved to be correct. But you don't know what's going to happen the next day. You don't know who's going to say, well, hold on, this was a vote for independence. This is what we now demand, etc. Uh, we felt the better bargaining chip was to, uh, to make very clear that a referendum was on the cards. That, uh, because uh, the outcome of the referendum was never in doubt. So, but, but you can only have <coughs> that referendum once or once over a lengthy period of time. Once you have the referendum, then you can't threaten a referendum again. It can't be used as a bargaining chip again. Uh, we felt that um, it was quite clear from our conversations in Baghdad that Baghdad was worried about the impact of the referendum and it did provide an opportunity for the sort of concentrated discussion on the future of the Kurdish region and to deal with some of the grievances that have been outstanding for so long. It was providing that opportunity for, the, um, uh, for movement towards a resolution. The threat of the referendum was very real uh, and I think we felt that that was doing its job and it would have been perhaps better to have found a way not to hold it but to accept the gains that the process of moving towards a referendum ha had allowed and then, uh, and then work on those. So we felt the bargaining chip was the threat of the referendum, not the result itself. Now, uh, plainly, this is a matter for political agreement or disagreement, but that was the view we took. So yes, I'd heard that argument. It was an argument the United Kingdom did not agree with. Thank you. Mike, you wanted to come so, in briefly. Just, uh, to follow up your first um, answer to Mr Rossendale, you said you came to your view about the referendum very early. When was that? Um, I, I, forgive me, I can't give you a, a, a timeline, but I know that as soon as the referendum date was, was mooted, um, because this was, uh, from memory, this is a couple of months before it actually happened. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a very long process. <coughs> we came to a decision fairly quickly that so we we're, felt we're uncomfortable. So we're talking about um, April. I would have thought it was later than that. Later than that, June. I, I, I can, I can find out. Uh, th this is quite important because there is a, a discussion, as you know, and perhaps other questions will come onto this about whether we were slow. So um, I, I, I will just leave it there. We can do. Uh, we, we can do so. Um, of course. Never mind. The Foreign Secretary dated the announcement of the referendum to be April 2017 and said that the Foreign Office responded after that. But President Barzani said in 2014 that there would be an independence referendum. So the Foreign Office seemed to be have been very slow to see the referendum coming or not. Well, hold on. Um, let's think about what was happening in the region at the time. Um, the possibility of a referendum, of course, has always been, uh, always been there, always been a possibility. I think it was the narrowing down to a date to say we are actually going to do this. Um, I think we'd always been, I, I think the view of the United Kingdom has always been clear that a, um, uh, a unilateral declaration of independence or unilateral moves were not likely to be the answer to the problems and issues that Iraq had as a whole. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it was only when a date was formalised then uh, it became necessary for the United Kingdom to formalise its own position. 
You can talk about something in theory and offer comments about it. I don't, I don't think there was anything during that period that would have given any indication that if, it was, uh, if a date was formalised, the British would come in behind it. I don't think there would be any evidence to suggest that at all. But certainly it was only, to, to my memory, it was only when the date was announced that it became necessary for us, obviously, to make sure the policy was, uh, was, was clear and soundly based. And I don't think there was any doubt about that. But in 2014, we were dealing with a completely different situation on the ground, where I suspect political aspirations were the last thing on people's minds as they dealt with the horror of the Daesh advance uh, and, and what, was, what was to come. So the fact that an idea of a referendum and an idea of Kurdish independence has always been there, we know that. But it's only when the date was formalised that it became necessary for the UK to be clear about what it thought. And I have absolutely no doubt about the clarity of that view in the run-up to the referendum whatsoever. Um, we've got a KRG quote as well about how prepared the Foreign Office work. But just to clarify, so prior to 20, April 2017, I just want to, just to get for the record, if you know what the Foreign Office or your department were doing to prepare, or, or are you saying it, you were just waiting that close... To the deadline. Well, I, I wasn't personally in office during that period, so I, I've got no personal memory in relation to that. I, I'm, I, again, I'm well aware from my background in the region that the possibility of a referendum was always, always there. I, I, I've not come across anything that would have indicated the United Kingdom's position to be different from what it is and to give anyone the sense that there was any go-ahead from the UK for a unilateral action such as that. I would be very surprised if there was evidence in relation to that. And That's right. We were urging the Baghdad authorities and the KRG to have a dialogue and resolve any differences of view within the framework of the Iraqi constitution. We, we've taken evidence um, on, on this issue and the KRG representative told us, the committee, that the UK's diplomatic proposal to avoid the referendum came two days before the vote. So would you argue that is correct or were you, were, were you the department slow to react or would you say that isn't uh, correct? I'm, I'm quite sure the, the, the KRG representative would be able to point to something as a formalised answer that late. What that was built on was weeks of discussion in the region, both with KRG and with Baghdad, uh, about putting together uh, an alternative uh, uh, suggestion, uh, a, way, uh, a way out, which had been worked on for weeks. To say it was only formalised at a late stage, there might certainly have been a document pulled together uh, uh, um, as, the, as the culmination of a variety of discussions because negotiations went on very late. It went right up to the hilt because we still hoped that the referendum might be pulled. But to suggest that that late publication of a document or the late availability of a document was the only representation we made to say you should call it off is, is absolutely not correct. It's not a, a correct interpretation. There were weeks and weeks of personal discussions, personal negotiations saying uh, we don't think this is right, and we are working with Baghdad to try and get something that will be a, a reasonable basis for negotiation, and the terms of which were known and discussed as, as time went on. It might have been framed uh, at a late stage, but that bore no relation to the discussions, that, but that was built on all the discussions that both sides were well aware of before then. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, 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 thank you. And uh, welcome, Minister. Um, Thank you, Mr. Austin. Can I? Both sides are now calling for the UK to mediate between Erbil and Baghdad. So, can I ask to what extent this has been happening? I mean, is the UK acting in a, a sort of mediating capacity? Not, me, not mediating as, as such, because we, we don't necessarily think it's that role, that we have that role. We have certainly been encouraging, as we have been doing for a long time. Um, as Amy has just suggested, um, better dialogue between between the two. Um, I, I think that there are legitimate reasons for concern in the Kurdish region that attempts to have engaged Baghdad over the years <coughs> to resolve differences between them have fallen on ears that were, were deafer than they should have been and that that was part of the process that led to the decision for the referendum. Um, 
But we are one of a number of states who believe that the resolution of these difficulties will add to the stability of the area. I don't think it's the United Kingdom to mediate. I don't think that's appropriate. And we've not had an indication from both sides that that is the appropriate position. But that we still retain a very strong interest in Baghdad and Erbil reaching an agreement is, is clear. And we will and we continue uh, when we visit uh, Iraq to seek to uh, uh, see those in the KRG as well as, uh, uh, as well as Baghdad. And of course, various messages can be passed. But to term it as mediation wouldn't be correct. Well, all the, almost all the Kurdish witnesses said that they hoped Britain would act in a, a sort of mediating capacity. What do you think is a barrier to Britain doing that then? I mean, what's... Um, well, there are many disputes around the world where people would like the British to act in a, a mediating capacity. Uh, and we can all think of, uh, all think of a number... Uh, Kashmir sort of comes to mind and places like that um, this is not for the UK to do this um, is not? it's not for the UK to do and certainly a mediation well, why? why? Well, uh, because I've got no indication from the Iraqi government that that is a role they believe the United Kingdom should play this is a sovereign matter for Iraq to okay. deal with uh, and, and I think that's, I think that's what's, uh, what's important it's got to be an Iraqi led solution not something coming in from the UK. I'm not aware of any invitation from Baghdad, for example, that the United Kingdom should act as mediator. Okay. This can't be done one-sided. The, the FCO submission said that the Kurds rejected mediation prior to the referendum. You seem to be suggesting now that it's Baghdad that is rejecting mediation. Um, I, I can't recall. Uh, I don't think that we have formally put mediation in this dispute to, to Baghdad. This is something that must be settled by Iraqis themselves. Each side knows the parameters that they've got to work with. It's got to deal with revenues, it's got to deal with budget, it's got to deal with, with borders, it's got to deal with internal autonomy. Um, uh, each side knows this. There's no suggestion that an outside state or body should be given uh, the responsibility to produce a deal which then each party would agree to. This is a sovereign matter for Iraq. So I don't think it's a question of blaming one side or the other. I don't think, it, I don't think it's appropriate for the British government to approach Baghdad and say, we demand to be the mediator in this dispute, is it? Well, We want to see it settled. And, and, and clearly, we worked with other states, with the EU, with the US, with other partners in the run-up to the referendum to try and get an agreement between the parties that would mean the referendum was not necessary and some of the long-standing issues between Baghdad and Erbil could be, uh, could be dealt with. Yesterday's Guardian uh, carried a story based on evidence of this committee which said that foreign office ministers, quote, foreign office ministers inadvertently helped neutralise the Iraqi Kurds, one of Britain's most effective allies, in efforts to limit Iranian influence in the Middle East. What's your response to that story? It's based on evidence from a former UK and NATO official <coughs> in evidence this committee which has been published. Uh, I've not read the story. What is the, uh, what is the quote based on? What is there the was evidence? Guardian yesterday. The yes. quote was... Foreign Office Ministers inadvertently helped neutralise the Iraqi Kurds, one of Britain's most effective allies, in efforts to limit Iranian influence in the Middle East. <coughs> uh, well, without having read the, the article or what the author would have used to substantiate that, um, I, I can only comment and say I, I'm, I'm not aware that we've taken such action that would have neutralised the, uh, the Iraqi Kurds. I don't see the Iraqi Kurds as being a neutralised body anyway. To be quite frank. What's, can I also ask, what's your response to evidence that confident, confidential, again submitted to the committee, that confidential UK intelligence documents, which have been, quote, circulating in official departments since at least February 2016, showed Iran's high level aim to create through Iraq and Syria an unbroken land corridor to the Middle East North Africa region? to further threaten Israel and Lebanon? Uh, firstly, as you know, I would never comment on any uh, UK intelligence documents or, or anything like that. 
that the overall aim of Iran to develop a land corridor is open source stuff that we that we all know. Um, but I've no comment to make in terms of British intelligence reports. Okay. Well, given, I mean, the sort of hands-off approach that you're advocating, you know, it's not for Britain to mediate, we can't become involved in this, no one's going to listen to us anyway. I, I'm not sure I said all that, well, Mr. Austin. All right, I mean, I'm, I might be sort of pushing it a bit, but that's basic, I mean... I mean, contrast that with Iranian engagement in the Kurdistan region. I mean, the other side are pretty engaged, aren't they? And we're taking a step back. Well, hold on. The, you could certainly never class the Iranian engagement as mediation. Um, and there must be, you know, quite a spectrum of involvement between. No, I wouldn't. I would say it's aggressive. Of I'd course, say we're taking a step back. Ab absolutely. I mean, I was, um, I was raising it to dismiss it. Uh, my point was, there's a spectrum of engagement in the region, uh, and I think it would be wrong and unfair to characterise British engagement in the region over a lengthy period uh, as as hands off. We've not been hands off in terms of physical support to Peshmerga, support for training, active uh, in relation to dealing with Daesh, pushing Daesh back, uh, and resisting pressures. In, in all those areas, we've been a lot. Uh, we've been very hands on. That hasn't been hands off. We've not been hands off in relation to the politics of Iraq either. We've got very good relationships uh, with both Baghdad and Erbil. Those relationships are built up on patient work many visits, many contacts, uh, uh, both ways. But um, there are differences of opinion between Erbil and Baghdad as to their ultimate future. All I'm saying is it's not for the United Kingdom to determine what that ultimate future is. It is for the United Kingdom to take a view on what is most conducive to stability in the area, what is most likely to prevent the rise of Daesh again and instability, and in terms of Iraq, the sectarian nature of the country, the way in which its politics is built upon it, uh, is, provides a constant risk that a, that a land of conflict, which has seen many people killed, many people displaced, that that risk remains. I think it's entirely proper for the United Kingdom to be engaged in that process and to use our efforts to urge all the parties to make sure they do not take actions which make it likely for conflict either to continue or to restart. Now, that's the nature of engagement. Now, that's not mediation, but it's a long way from being uh, hands-off. That there are others involved in the area with different interests, we are well aware of. Uh, and we know the activities of those in PMF and HD who take their orders from, uh, from outside the country. We're well of the, uh, aware of those uh, as well. Um, but our, our determination, therefore, is to give Iraq the confidence to make its own decisions, not to be dependent on those from outside, not to be influenced by external actors, and to support the political parties and the, and the building of the political institutions that will give strength and independence to a unified Iraq, that it can make its relationships without needing to look over its shoulder all the time at those who mean it harm. And in recent times, we've seen a relatively new bridge to Iraq from Saudi Arabia uh, for the first time for a long time, trying to give Iraq a sense of its uh, Arab relationships uh, as well as those from its closest neighbours who may have different aims. So uh, that, that's my sense in a nutshell of where we should be. So it's proper engagement, it's not mediation, it's not hands-off, and it's being very clear-eyed about the activities of others in the, uh, in the region. Well, I know we'll all congratulate um, the new Minister for Education, Mr. Zahawi, who asked the first question. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Very oh, good. Can well, I the, ask... The Bard of Stratford-on-Avon, I mean. There you go. Uh, very, very, very appropriate. You'll be teaching Shakespeare to them like it's going out of fashion. Stephen, did you want to... Uh... Yeah, of course. Hello, congratulations to the team. Um, what was it? Devolved issue as well. Um, <laughs> and in Wales. And in Wales as well, yes. But I'm sure it'll make an excellent job for people in England. Um, can you just set out, Minister, and thanks for coming to join us today, um, any recent changes to the levels of funding and staffing in the FCO's Erbil consulate, please? Um, uh, let me have a quick look. 
Uh, I don't think there's been any uh, any dramatic change uh, as, as far as I'm aware. Um, no. So no changes to either funding or no. staffing, and no. no changes proposed. No. Over the next the, the next little while. Okay. No, not as far as I'm aware. No. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's 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 helpful to establish. Um, in November 2017, the consulate changed its name on the Facebook to remove the words um, <coughs> Iraqi. Kurdistan region. I mean, I think there was a mention that this was to save space, but do you think the timing was best in terms of trying to change the name on the Facebook page, given the referendum? I don't think it's a matter of timing. It was a practical issue. I have a note made. If you forgive me, let me let me read it. Please. Yes. Yeah, this is an help. important thing. Yeah. In terms of current footprint, just to establish sort of how important Erbil is, a permanent consulate general in Erbil consists of FCO diplomatic staff defence advisor from the MOD, advisor to the Ministry of Peshmerga Affairs and DFID staff working on humanitarian response and stabilisation efforts. We also offer a consular service, so that's the, what we provide in, uh, in Erbil. The British Consulate General in Erbil has not changed its name. Its Facebook page was recently changed from English only to English and Kurdish. The name on the site was subsequently shortened as the previous title exceeded the maximum allowed characters. The British Consulate General in Erbil has informed local media and officials of the, uh, of, of the change. I'm sorry if the nature of the change caused any consternation, um, but, but really it shouldn't, and I'm very pleased to make very clear the representation doesn't change. OK, well, can I just... And, and, and reading out that statement was very, very helpful. Can I just pick up on two different parts of that? One of the numbers of staff and the other one's Facebook changes. I'm wondering if you set out, with the numbers of staff that you set out, how many members of staff is that in total, or how many sort of local members of staff versus um, locally recruited members of staff, and has that gone up or down in recent times? Uh, well, remarkably, I have the figures to hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very effective operation. There's roughly eight UK-based, eight yep. local staff. I'm not aware of those numbers changing uh, okay. remarkably uh, in recent times, no. Thank you. <clears throat> And in terms of the <coughs> Facebook changes, what kind of feedback did you get from the local authorities in Erbil about those Facebook changes, if any? Um, as far as I'm aware, I mean, um, uh, once people had sort of, sort of noticed the name, there was there was no particularly adverse reaction. People were fine about it, and they're, they're pleased that our representation and regard Facebook information as, as perfectly straightforward, as far as I'm aware. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Free. And you were going to come in. Um, the um, Speaker of the KRG's Parliament told us that the FCO's engagement in the region was far too focused on leaders and elites to the detriment of, of his words, democratic political institutions and civil society. <coughs> Do you agree with that or not? Um. Well, I'm, 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 I'm obviously interested in, uh, in His Excellency's representations. Um, I, I'd be surprised. Uh, it's the hallmark of our diplomatic staff abroad that they gain their information by being engaged throughout a community and throughout a region uh, without providing a, uh, without being aware of a list of organisations with whom uh, our, our Consul General would be in contact, though I could supply it. It, it's not the way in which we work. Certainly ministers, if they're on visits, then, then yes, uh, um, inevitably you, you're drawn towards the, the properly elected representatives and the political representatives, and I've, tended to go and, uh, I've certainly tended to go and see those. But I'm well aware that both ambassador and consul general make sure they keep in touch with elements of civil society because they give very valuable information. Um, I'm happy to, to go back and, and check and make sure that if that is a criticism, that we meet it, um, because it's it, it's only you know by uh, by keeping ears to the ground that you you pick up what you need to to pick up, um, and this is a society which is extremely voluble, where people want to talk, where people want to represent their various groups uh, and make sure that they're heard, um, uh, and I've met business uh, business groups and, and others while I've been there in the past. So I've certainly met civil society representatives also while I've been there. But I, I will check and make sure that we don't leave a, a gap in our armour if that's a worry that people have there. 
Yeah, thank you, Minister. I think it would be quite useful to know which institutions they have engaged with, um, because I know civil society uh, sometimes feels that it's not properly engaged. Okay, if, if you would wish, uh, Chair, then perhaps I could write to the committee uh, as, as a follow-up and just say I've spoken to Consul General, this is, uh, this is his regular round and this is what our local staff and uh, UK-based staff do in order to make sure they're fully informed from all sections of the community. Thank you. Happy to do that. No more? Mike. Um, well, let's move on. Yes. Syria. Okay. Um, can, can I um, ask you another, another question? Sorry. Do you want to ask that? There's another, there's another question before. Sorry. If you wish to. I thought you were editing yourself. Um, are you worried that Baghdad is punishing the Kurds rather than talking with them? Has a blockade been placed on the K KRG? And how is that affecting the prospects for a diplomatic solution? And are elements in the Iraqi state, particularly the popular mobilization forces, behaving in sectarian or ethnically chauvinistic ways towards the Kurds? Um, I'm very glad we, uh, we reached that question and that you wanted to ask it, because that's really important. Um, our sense is that in the immediate aftermath of the referendum, when the situation was extremely febrile, uh, all sorts of difficult possibilities were, were, were open. Uh, certainly the risk of a clash between Iraqi forces and Kurdish forces was very real. It, we believe that the way in which those difficulties were handled in the short period after the referendum gave rise to a great deal of hope. There wasn't, in fact, the sort of clash that there might have been. There were some limited exchanges, which we know, but the risk of a substantial clash, which would have resulted from uh, significant resistance uh, on a point on the map uh, and resistance uh, to Iraqi forces recovering disputed areas, was avoided. Um, and that was avoided because people sort of looked into the abyss and said, we don't want to do this. Now, we take from that 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 requires understanding uh, from those on both sides and it needs a sense of uh, no triumphalism and uh, recognising that in the painful aftermath of the referendum, both sides had to continue to make concessions to each other. We're therefore extremely keen that Baghdad, having achieved uh, the recovery of disputed territory in the manner in which it did, is able to continue its political relationship in a similar way, understanding what needs to be done, making concessions, and working uh, on the long-term relationship, and I, I, as I say clearly, dealing with some of the things that weren't dealt with for many years, and not being uh, in any way vindictive uh, towards those in the Kurdish region. Uh, it's essential that that happens. There is no <coughs> future if Baghdad politics are influenced by a determination from those who wish to see the Kurdish region punished and who wish to see political advantage uh, from doing so. Uh, the committee will be well aware of the politics of Baghdad and the uh, uh, the way in which the Prime Minister has to navigate between different groups, uh, each with, uh, uh, with different aims that might be urging uh, the government to be less conciliatory than we think it ought to be. Now, it's very, very important that the forces of moderation, of conciliation, uh, win the day. And that needs both sides to be receptive to that. But it's really important that it, that it is. Our sense at the moment is that is still the case, but we would be deeply concerned if there was evidence, if there was strong evidence, that electoral success in Baghdad uh, was being created at the expense of damage to the Kurdish region, uh, because that's highly risky uh, and will not lead to the resolution and the non-sectarian future of Iraq that uh, 
Iraq's leaders aspire to when they talk about the future of the country, even though electoral bases are often very sectarian based. So uh, there should not be punishment and that the and Baghdad and Erbil should continue <coughs> the progress they made when they drew back from what could have been a terrible confrontation and they make sure the politics now doesn't create the situation in which a confrontation might re arise. Yeah, I mean I I you know I understand your sort of desire to smooth things over and all that. But I'm concerned that you're downplaying sort of Baghdad's aggression here. I mean, it's my understanding that uh, nearly 100 Peshmerga were killed in Kirkuk, that there were substantial clashes on at least two other occasions on the border with, uh, on the border of the KRG area with troops facing each other. Um, I think the, I mean, would you agree that the closure of the, the two airports extended now for another two months is, uh, is, you know, it's a harsh reaction designed to punish the Kurds. Um, I mean, it has a particularly severe impact on people who want to see their families or yep. seek medical attention who have to go through Baghdad, which is obviously much more difficult and all that. And my worry about all this is that the, the sort of lack of criticism from the UK and others may convince Baghdad that it can do anything it likes without censure. And that leaves the Kurds sort of swinging in the wind and uh, particularly when it seems that the sort of default Baghdad position is centralisation and uh, uh, and aggression. Um, we made very clear from the uh, from the closure of the airports and the border issues that it had to be one of the first things that was sorted out between the respective parties and we've continued to make that clear right the way through. We call on both sides to find a way to reopen the airports and sort the border problem out as a, uh, as a step forward. Um, it isn't something that is helpful uh, in the area at all and we've been very clear and we've been very public about that. But as far as the ultimate aim... But it is designed purely to punish the Kurds, isn't it? I mean, there's no other justification for it. Well, that's a matter for the that's a matter for the Iraqi authorities, but it's part of the overall it's part of the overall dispute between the two that is it desperately that UK, needs settled. Is it something that the UK government condemns? It's something that the UK government has suggested to both sides needs to be clearly needs to be dealt with. It is not helpful to the situation that this continues and it should be it should be one of the first things that gets sorted out. It's important to do so. Um, but the characterisation you went on with after that to say Baghdad's intent is a, um, you know, a, a centralised a centralised state without autonomy and the like. Well, firstly, I mean, uh, that doesn't reflect the reality of what the autonomous uh, KRG region has has been that we wish to see continued. But this is a matter for uh, Iraqi politics, uh, and we would we would urge and have urged uh, Baghdad and Erbil to work on the constitutional relationships within the current constitution uh, and find their way to the resolution of the difficulties between them. Um, it's a matter for them. Uh, and we, you know, we, we try and highlight the things that are likely to cause damage and conflict. Experience in the region, as we all know, is that if you leave undealt with long-standing grievances, if one side takes action against the other which perpetuates or accentuates the grievances, if, for instance, the Sunni community feel in the future that they're excluded by a government as they were uh, some, some years ago, we all know what the result is of that. Now, people there are living with the results of sectarian uh, bias and difficulties without people being engaged in the process of government, people feeling excluded we don't have to do much pointing to the damage that that causes. Accordingly, making very clear what the feeling uh, and expression was in the Kurdish region as exemplified by the referendum. And the people there don't need any explaining of how important that is. So everything points to a constitutional and political process that seeks to resolve such difficulties and warns of the danger of uh, undue pressure, actions likely to stir up 
uh, unrest and cause conflict, and everything militates towards dealing with those. That is the role of outside friends, of both, to try and encourage people to move away from the things that would cause conflict in the future. We can see the risks and the danger. That's why I answered Ms. Clurd uh, as, as I did. Uh, um, and that's why we feel our role is to work with both to avoid the sort of issues which have caused such damage in the past. I could understand that if the response from Baghdad to the referendum had been to say, look, here are the benefits of being part of Iraq, we're stronger together, the, you know, whatever it might be. But that wasn't the response from Baghdad, was it? The response from Baghdad was to send troops in and close the airport and impose a blockade. So it, it's difficult to see how the government can be confident that it's, you know, you know that its approach is sort of going to bear fruit it, it's in all this. I mean, it seems to me that Baghdad's working quite hard to justify the sort of Kurdish view that Iraq can never work for the Kurds, even if they've got to stay for now. It's a process. It's a process. Uh, you will know as well as me, uh, there are many different voices impacting on the government I in Baghdad. There are many who would want Baghdad to take a much harsher uh, approach to the Kurdish region than we have seen. Sadly, there are always those who see advantage in conflict, advantage, at z at politics being a zero-sum game. You can only prove your strength and your... Uh, uh, your um, uh, your ability to command and your authority if you punish X. We've seen in the region the consequences of that. Now, all we can do is warn and work with those who want to prevent such a thing. But it's not done overnight. Um, the, the referendum... There may, there may be a tendency to see the referendum from just one side here. Uh, the Kurdish region uh, 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 put it forward... Um, it, it didn't go the way they planned. They seemed to be the aggrieved party. Uh, it had considerable impact in Baghdad as well. Uh, they see it as something which they warned against. They offered an alternative to. They offered a way out that wasn't accepted. That's their interpretation. That's for them to decide. Um, and accordingly, those that feel rebuffed want to make sure it doesn't happen again and have a different approach to this. We're very clear. Unless people are prepared to put to one side, now move on from the referendum, make something of the lack of confrontation afterwards, and look towards the unity that Iraq badly needs, that's been so difficult to achieve, then these sectarian conflicts will continue. Now, that's our job. But there are other voices impacting on those in Baghdad. There are people who see an advantage in conflict, in disruption and everything else. They're strong voices. And the Baghdad government, you know, is, is aware of this. So they've got a path to navigate. It, it's, it's too soon. The elections are coming within a matter of months. We all know the pressures that election causes on all of us as we get positions put in place and everything else. That's got to be recognised too. So this is a process. I would not expect um, all the issues between Baghdad and Erbil to have been settled in the, in the handful of weeks since the referendum. It's not going to be. But our advice has got to be consistent uh, and, to, uh, uh, and to work. There were opportunities before the referendum. Baghdad offered negotiations. Uh, there were chances to move away from it. For whatever reason, they weren't taken. But that's done now. Now how do we make sure that conflict doesn't return and we build on those who want to see a greater degree of consensus? It won't happen overnight but our view on it should be consistent, and it is. Okay, thank you. Mike. Can we turn to uh, Syria and uh, related question of Turkey? Yeah. Um, the UK government and Turkey have very different views about the um, relationships between the uh, Syrian Kurdish PYD, YPG, and the uh, Turkish PKK. Um, we were told uh, by the Foreign Secretary that we don't share the perspective of the Turkish government on this matter. The Foreign Office's submission to us says 
developments in Syria will also undoubtedly play into the thinking of the Turkish authorities regarding the possibility of a return to negotiations with the PKK. If we don't share the perspective of the Turkish government, why should that be the case? Um, the links and the relationships across this area, you will be well aware, as, uh, as I am, are, are, are deep uh, and, uh, and complex. Um, countering the PKK is a key driver of Turkish policy at home and abroad. Uh, they're very clear. Uh, we share, we share uh, condemnation of the PKK. Uh, I must make that absolutely clear. Um, Turkey's uh, a, a key partner on counter-terrorism. Uh, we want to work with them. Um, but uh, there, is no, there is no difference of opinion in terms of describing the PKK as a terrorist group uh, from which they, uh, the Turkish government uh, suge uh, face a severe security threat. There was dialogue uh, between them. It ended in, in 2015. It's the United Kingdom's view we would like to see that dialogue uh, recommence. That will be a matter for, for Turkey. Um, but uh, again, if there is to be any solution in the region, people have got to you know, find a way back to dialogue uh, because there can be greater threats in the region as we have seen from the combined efforts in relation to, uh, uh, to fighting Daesh. But how could developments in Syria lead to a return to negotiations with the PKK. The Amy, being closer to Turkey than, than I am. I think um, it, Turkey faces a serious terrorist threat from the PKK, uh, and countering that threat is obviously a high priority for them. Uh, looking across their borders and the instability that they face on their doorstep. Clearly, their domestic concern around the PKK will be part of their consideration, uh, and legitimately so. So, that will inform their assessment of I'm, how to handle I'm, the threats. I'm they sorry, face. are you saying that the defeat of the PYD uh, in Syria would be perceived as weakening of the PKK, and therefore there would be more chances of uh, negotiations, or? that uh, a, a victory or a, a strengthening of the PYD um, uh, and, and, and the uh, YPG would actually lead to a negotiation. I'm not clear which it is. I don't want to speak for the Turkish government and I know that you've taken evidence from them as well. I think all we would say is that you know, Turkey looks at this challenge in a regional context. I understand that. but. I'm quoting an FCO submission mm -hmm. which said this. It's not, I'm not quoting a Turkish government document. I'm quoting the position of our mm -hmm. government. I'm not clear why. I, are you saying both of these options would lead to the same outcome? Or I, I, I'm unclear as to what you would regard as more likely to facilitate the negotiating position with, between the Turkish government and the PKK. Uh, an end to the conflict in Syria helps the resolution of all these issues. Um, I think from what we see at the moment, uh, a resolution which involves a complete victory for one side or the other seems uh, unlikely, uh, and that's why we wish to support the efforts Stefan de Mistura is making to bring it to a negotiated end. There are areas controlled by different groups, of course, uh, SDF with, um, uh, with, with, their, uh, with their supporters. Uh, uh, will continue to occupy territory at the moment uh, we want if we can get a negotiated end to the conflict then it enables other issues to be dealt with which will include uh, we think the opportunities for Turkey to deal uh, to look back and have an opportunity of dialogue with PKK the longer the conflict goes on, the more difficult that is. And clearly, the situation at the moment is uh, Turkey is not going to consider uh, any, uh, any concession, any negotiations with PKK or those they see as affiliated to them at 
this stage while the conflict is going on. That's why a resolution in the conflict in, in Syria makes a difference to that possibility. Okay. Um, what is your assessment of the links between the PYD and YPG with the PKK? Are uh, they ideological? Are they financial? Are they organisational? Uh, okay, um, we're very concerned of possible links. We don't uh, seek any uh, link with the with the PKK ourselves in any way, but there are we are concerned about the links, uh, and we urge the PYD at all times to sever any links they might have with PKK. But the nature of the links, perhaps Amy again can describe. Just to step back a bit, perhaps you know the, the Daesh coalition is working with the Syria Democratic Forces against Daesh in northern Syria, as the committee knows and has heard from other witnesses. And the YPG units form part of that, alongside Arab units. The YPG is the military wing of the of the PYD, and as the minister has said, we are aware of reports of links between the PYD and the PKK. Now, we don't have any contact with the PKK. They're a terrorist organisation that's described in the UK. Uh, and we have only very infrequent contact with the PYD. So I don't want to comment in detail on how either of those organisations works, given our... We, we, had, we, had, we had evidence given to us by many different witnesses. We've also had written submissions, and you referred to reports... Uh, it is well known that um, PKK fighters have fought alongside uh, other Kurds in other parts of the region. Mm -hmm. um, it is well known that Ocalan's photograph is displayed on demonstrations and public spaces mm -hmm. and so on. Um, these aren't just reports. There are links. I, my question was, mm -hmm. what links does the PYD, YPG, have with the PKK? Mm. Why did you say that? You know, no, well, I'm asking what your assessment is. Presumably you do an assessment in the Foreign Office of these things, uh, because the Turkish government are constantly sending you and us and everybody else great big tomes of allegations about links. Mm. Presumably you have to assess uh, when you receive that is this true? Is it, is it untrue? Um, and so on. I, I'm asking a simple question. What ideological links are there? What financial links are there? What organisational links are there? Both organisations do uh, have uh, uh, a regard for the role of Abdullah Abdullah, as you pointed out. I... Uh, in terms of the, the existence or depth of those links, it's not right for us to comment. What I've been why, why, really why is it not right to comment? Well, I was, uh, you know, we're aware of the reports, <coughs> uh, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand why it's not right to comment. You must have a view, um, and ultimately, given that our NATO partner and ally, Turkey. Mm -hmm takes a very robust position on this. Mm -hmm. And given that we deem, designate the PKK as a terrorist organisation, and the Minister mm -hmm. has just repeated that, yeah. um, and that the Turkish government and others, including witnesses we've had, mm -hmm. say there are close, very close links between people within the YPG and the PKK, mm -hmm. um, uh, why is it not right for you to comment on it? Well, uh, let, me, uh, let, let me help out. Um, I, I, I'm not sure quite wh where you're going with this. We've no contact with PKK. We are aware of links, as you're aware of links. Uh, it's a dominant force in the Syrian Democratic Forces. We're not supplying any equipment to those forces. We're not supplying any weapons to those support uh, forces. Uh, they get uh, air support because they're engaged in, uh, in conflict there that we support. And uh, when we talk to uh, PYD, uh, YPG in relation to, uh, to this, we, uh, we, uh, we say that they should sever links with the PKK. Now, the practicalities are they're probably not. 
so those links are there. But we, uh, we know about that, but we don't have any contact with PKK, and we do raise it with, uh, with PYD but, 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 all the time. But, but sorry, are there any organisational links between the PYD, YPG, and the PKK? Um, well, then, they're, they're not the same. They're not the I, same I, bodies. I, I, I know they're not the same, but are there organisational links? That's simple. Do they have the same international structure? We'll have to. We'll <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to come back in more detail. We've had, we've had several witnesses come to say, to, to sit before us to say that they're so close as to be indistinguishable. We regard them as separate, and we advise uh, we advise PUID to sever links with the PKK. Okay, uh, but, but doesn't that imply that you think that they have substantial enough links to worry about? And they've clearly got links, um, but it's a it, it's a messy situation on the ground. Okay, can I try a few more questions? Then maybe we can get it a different way. Do weapons and personnel pass between the PKK and the armed affiliates of the PYD? I would be astonished if weapons sort of used in the conflict were not passed between respective parties who were fighting on the same side. And it would be naive to think anything different. We do not supply any weapons I'm not into this situation. You you supply. I'm but do they transfer you. between parties who are fighting against the same enemy? Of course they do. Okay. Turkey says that weapons provided by NATO countries uh, are reaching the PKK, presumably from uh, the other route. From do you agree with that view? We're aware of Turkey's concerns, and uh, you know I'm not aware of any UK uh, weapons that. I'm not have asking been about in UK that weapons, about NATO countries' weapons, mm -hmm. the United States and other weapons are, as you know, given in yeah. considerable quantities to uh, people who are fighting in Syria against Assad mm -hmm. and against Daesh. I'm not going to volunteer you an answer I don't know. If you want me to provide an answer to this, I will provide it by letter right. to the chair okay. afterwards. All right. Um, you, if um, there are connections between the PYD and the uh, YPG and the PKK, and you, Minister, you've said there are connections. We are concerned about links between yeah. them and why, from all the why, evidence you've Why had. have we not designated it as a terrorist organisation? Because we believe they're separate organisations, we prescribe PKK, but we've not sought to do so. And we don't, uh, we don't talk about those we don't prescribe. We have to give reasons for bodies that we prescribe, but we don't give reasons for those that we don't. OK, final question. Um, your submission to us and the questions we've just had show that there are commonalities between what's happening in southern Turkey and northern Syria, um, why do they not fall under one department and one minister inside the FCO? Why, why do we have separate ministers dealing with that, that, that given that we are in a complex regional issue here? Um, you make a very wise point. Uh, it, it, Turkey is indeed handled in a different portfolio. Uh, I'm hoping to go to Ankara quite soon because the, the influence of Turkey obviously in relation to Iraq around Syria is, is very clear. Um, it's one of those it's one of those areas that we have to we have to share. It, it, it comes under Near East inside the department. Uh, I cover the uh, Middle East and, and North Africa okay. region, but uh, it, it's not siloed and it shouldn't be. I need to make sure that my contacts with uh, with Turkish uh, officials and Turkish ministers uh, are, are clear because there are areas where obviously I've got to have the relationship with them in terms of what's happening in Syria and the like. But um, although you've always got to have you, you've always got to have some uh, some lines for who is in charge of what uh, at the border areas, there's got to be easy access for information to both ministers who have a responsibility and we'll make sure that's the case. And the reshuffle hasn't uh, changed those responsibilities? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware that Mark has shuffled over Turkey to me. Uh, I think I think it, 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 it's a good point. Um, but as I say, there are, there are a number of places where you've got to have contacts outside your portfolios. The portfolios are not that rigid. 
There's no issue about me going to Ankara and talking to officials and ministers there, or seeing them when they're here. And when I'm at, uh, when any of us are at conferences, whether it's uh, to talk about the uh, to, uh, about the region, whether you're dealing with um, you're going to Geneva to talk about Syria, you're meeting representatives from other areas. So you just do ordinarily. But so the, the fact that they're in different portfolios in the FCO shouldn't make a difference, um, and we should make sure that there are no artificial boundaries and that we know as, uh, enough as, as what we need to know to answer questions. Okay. Um. Uh, you know, of course, that uh, uh, until comparatively recently, the Turkish government was talking to the PKK. Yes. And it was only when, uh, as I understand it, Erdogan uh, switched his attention elsewhere that the P PKK was no longer um, a, a, a somebody to, for the Turks to talk to. Um, will you be raising that issue with him? Um, uh, with we're quite clear uh, about the nature of the uh, of, of the PKK. Since the breakdown of a ceasefire which lasted two and a half years in July 2015, more than a thousand Turkish security force personnel uh, have been killed by the PKK and over 400 civilians killed in PKK bombings and clashes. We condemn unreservedly uh, PKK violence. Uh, of course, uh, we want uh, to go, we would urge a situation pre the breakdown in the in the dialogue, um, and that's a matter very much for uh, for the Turkish government. Of course, we would all like to see an opportunity reopen to try and settle uh, the um, uh, the conflict between them, which has led to such loss of life. Uh, so it will certainly be raised. It's a matter for the Turkish government, um, but we are very clear uh, about the current position of the PKK. Uh, and clearly that has to change if there's to be meaningful dialogue and an end to the violence. Um, I'm sure you, you'd agree that whether we recognise it or not, an autonomous uh, Kurdish-led region has emerged de facto in northern Syria. Um, will the UK engage with it, ignore it, or what? We support uh, Stefan de Mistura's work in the Geneva process, which is the only, the only way forward of resolving these issues in Syria. We don't support bilateral opportunities for countries to start being engaged with different areas. We support the territorial integrity of Syria. Uh, after this desperate civil war and conflict, which has been perpetuated by President Assad, largely against his own people. Um, the resolution of this, the constitutional resolution of this, has to be handled by just one body and there has to be one process. That is the Geneva process uh, that Stefan de Mistura is, is followed, backed by uh, UN, General, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, and that's what we shall support. Thank you. Okay. Question. Minister, has the PYD been intolerant of political opposition? I don't know the answer to that question. Go on. The PYD is playing a role on the ground in northern Syria uh, now, as the committee knows, and uh, uh, what's really important in the way that is done is that uh, it does provide legitimate local governance. Obviously, that needs to involve all the communities that live in that region. <coughs> and uh, uh, any contact we have with them through the coalition would be to urge uh, that approach. Are you talking particularly about Raqqa? Oh, just particularly in, in general. So in the, in the answer that the, um, Ms. Clement Shaw just gave to me, um, do you get a sense that they are intolerant of political opposition, people that are opposed to them? The we, we, want, we want to see an inclusive political process in, in, in the region, and there are, uh, there's aspects of PYD activity that cause us concern in relation to that, yes. And that's PYD? Yes. Um, you talk to the PYD, although you say not 
a great deal. What other Kurdish groups in northern Syria um, does the FGO have a dialogue with? <laughs> Uh, PYD, YPG is the main Kurdish actor on the ground. Uh, um, I'll ask colleagues to supply some others. Kurdish National Council as part of the moderate op op opposition. Uh, so it's predominantly them, P PYD, YPG and the Kurdish National Council. There are a number of other actors. Um, the FCO says that hold, you, you've considered that you hold these conversations, um, and you hold conversations presumably about the future of Syria. Can the future be successfully negotiated without the diplomatic inclusion of the PYD? Without diplomatic inclusion yeah. of the of PYD? Well, we. we um, uh, the process by which Stefan Mistura gathers the voices that he needs at Geneva does include um, Kurdish representatives. They are included in the peace negotiations through the Kurdish National Council's participation in the High Negotiations Committee and then the Syrian Negotiation Committee. So the short answer to your question is no. Uh, there won't be a settlement in the region unless all voices are heard. And I'm quite sure the UN envoy is, is, is very clear about that. PYD says that it's been excluded from the process. Well, uh, again, that's that's a matter for the uh, that's a matter for Stefan de Mistura to make the decision about. So, from the FCO point of view, from the UK position, you think that the PYD need to be involved in any diplomatic solution? They say they've been excluded. Is it then your submission that the FCO would be pushing for their inclusion in any future diplomatic uh, conversations that they feel <laughs> currently they're excluded from? I, I, I think two things are worth noting. Clearly, um, the FCO's position would be you would want everyone who's got an appropriate say to have that opportunity, but there have to be parameters because there are people whose views are such that they can't be included in peace negotiations. Now, this has got to be a matter for Syrians to decide and for the UN to organise, so they're aware of this. You spoke earlier about the concerns about intolerance of certain groups. There's, if you're going to get a peace negotiation to work, everybody's got to be prepared to bring something to it, and that will require a tolerance for others and a recognition of others. If that's not possible, then you can't have the negotiations. Now, we, uh, we trust the UN envoy to have the, uh, to have the say in relation to this, bearing in mind all the information that's available to him about the respective views of the parties. Thank you. Um, the Foreign Office uh, submission to us says that the UK has provided, quote, military support for the Syrian Democratic Forces. It doesn't specify what that military support is. Um, we know that the United States has been giving military hardware and a significant amount of support to the uh, YPG um, and uh, as you've already commented on the, uh, uh, the YPG are the largest component of the Syrian Democratic Forces um, what uh, exactly is the military support that the UK has been giving and to who, who have we been giving it the Global Coalition provides military air support to the Syrian Democratic Forces in the fight against Daesh. The US is leading international efforts to support the SDF and they provide ammunition uh, and other uh, equipment. The UK does not provide weapons or ammunition to anyone in Syria, as I said earlier. So it's the air support provided by the Global Coalition, nothing more. So we haven't provided any weaponry nope. at all? No. Nope. I can recall uh, in a previous committee receiving uh, various letters uh, from the Foreign Office about uh, equipment of some kind that was being given to opposition forces in Syria. Yeah, um, non-lethal equipment. No, I know it was non-lethal, yeah. and it included various uh, things like chemical protection outfits and uh, 
some kind of medical assistant yeah. and tents IED and so protection on. Yeah. Like that. Um, can you be more detailed have we have we given that kind of material to the Syrian democratic forces um, I know we've not provided any military hardware or weapons I do remember the conversations about this many years ago because former Foreign Secretary William Hague we had a lot of conversations at the early stage of this process about what support could be given uh, and the Americans were more forward-leaning than we were, but we were very clear that we could not and should not provide weapons into the situation. We wouldn't have uh, found it appropriate to do so, and we got no sense from Parliament that that would be right. But we did supply the, uh, uh, the hardware that you're talking about in terms of the non-lethal equipment for protection. As far as I'm aware, in relation to the SDF, we have not, not even the, the equipment you're talking about. Okay, have we given them any money, any funding? No. It, it's global air support. It's not, it's not through finance or anything okay. like that. All right. Now, the Foreign Office draws a clear distinction between the SDF and the YPG. Um, but we've had numerous submissions from witnesses who've said to us, that the YPG is the dominant force within the SDF. the SDF. Why do you continue to make this distinction between them? Is it simply because of the problem we've already discussed with regard to Turkey, or is it other reasons? Um, I think it's because we're aware of a number of... I mean, there are, there are many groups operating, as the committee knows very well, uh, and we recognise the fact that the YPD has a significant presence of the SDF, but there are other groups involved as well. So I think that's why we make the distinction. We don't regard the SDF as a YPD force, but we uh, accept entirely what common sense tells us about the influence that, that they have and the significance that they have, yes. But it is true... But they're that, not the only people there. No, but it is true that the YPG, through the SDF, are working in alliance with us as part of the international coalition. That is right. We, we support the SDF as part right. of the international coalition. And yes. that our air strikes and the air uh, uh, operations that you've already referred to do benefit, have benefited, are benefiting the YPG on the ground in their fight inside Syria. Well, if it's a fight against Daesh forces, uh, then um, then that is important and important for the United Kingdom to support. Thank you. Just the, um, we talked about mediation before. The following on from this exchange is the UK prepared to offer sort of formal mediation between central governments and Kurdish groups in the region more generally as a way of preventing uh, future conflicts. When you say in the region more generally, do you mean sort of cross-border? Well, with the other Kurdish groups, yeah. And sort of... Not just the... Obviously, we talked about the KRG earlier. Yeah. We've been talking about the sort of other Kurdish groups. So are we, are we prepared to offer mediation with them? Well... Mm. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure if mediation is the right word. Mediation implies uh, a, a position of, of, of difference between two different sides in which you know, there is middle ground to be sought and, and work to be done to try and create a process to resolve difficulties. If we're dealing with other sovereign governments, again, I'm not sure it's the place for the United Kingdom to offer that sort of mediation. I would imagine sovereign governments would be quite resistant. If, however, it's a question of the United Kingdom using its diplomatic influence, as we have been trying to in the region for some time, to uh, point to those areas where conflict might re-arise, to offer advice about how conflict might be uh, scaled back, to offer advice about institution building, non-sectarianism, the things that can be done to, um, uh, to prevent uh, communities feeling excluded and communities being pushed towards an area of conflict, absolutely. I think that will be a more important 
role for the United Kingdom in the future in the region uh, than anything else. Um, I think when I look at the uh, joint offer that DFID and the FCO can make, conflict resolution should be right up there. I mean, in, in Yemen, dealing on the one hand with those involved in the conflict and dealing on the other hand with those who are the victims of the conflict and supplying humanitarian aid, you'd want to do everything you could to prevent the issue arising in the first place. The, 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 the Kurdish issue throughout the region is very live, is, is obvious and clear. But almost each part of it has not only a, a, a series of interests held in common, such as the need to push back on Daesh and the like, but because of the territorial nature of the place, individual issues with Turkey uh, or with Syrian regime uh, or with Iran that we've spoken of very little or, or Iraq are individual to them and I would imagine fiercely protected by the various states. So I think probably people in the area might be cautious of a linkage between all the various groups and treating them in some way as acting together. And I think because of the nature of the relationship between the Kurdish groups themselves, I think there's a resistance amongst them because they have different interests and different objectives. But I think within a sense of these issues are unlikely to go away, accordingly what can be done and what can uh, those states outside do to, to help people move towards resolving the conflicts, I would hope the United Kingdom could indeed offer and play a part. Are there any final points before we... I want to ask one question. Um, you, um, you talked earlier about um, visits um, that you're hoping to do to Ankara and so on. I just yeah. wonder how, what the pressure is at the moment, bearing in mind the arithmetic in the Commons and um, the lack of cooperation between um, front, uh, um, whips offices and stuff. I just wonder what the pressure is like, whether it's more difficult now than you've known it previously or, or and whether it's um, hurting... Um, our ability or the FCO's ability to get its point across or not? Um, on behalf of colleagues, I would be grateful if there was a little bit more leeway. At present, what we, what we do is we go out at the end of the week. So you look to, because we've managed to make Thursdays as far as possible one-liners, then we can get out um, on, a, on a Thursday morning. Uh, in some countries, of course, a Friday is a non-day, yeah. so, so for me, it's often uh, going on a Friday and then using the Saturday and particularly the Sunday uh, to be in a place and then return to, uh, overnight on, on a Monday. Is it impossible? No, it's not. Is it more difficult than it was? Yes. Uh, and if there was a little bit of help all round so that there was some flexibility so that ministers in foreign office and international development and those other ministers that need to travel abroad could get a little bit of flexibility, that would help. Uh, we can manage um, and understand the parliamentary arithmetic and parties must uh, do the jobs they're, they're there to do, so I'm not making a particular plea, but thank you for recognising it. And there may come one or two particular... If there are specific conferences on particular days that we need to get to and there's some on a Wednesday, then I'd want to go and want to be able to go without feeling that it was impossible to do so. For routine opportunities to see our counterparts, I don't mind using the weekends. I think that's part of our responsibility. But if on occasion there was something really important we had to get to, I'd like to feel that a uh, relationship between the WIPS offices would allow uh, a little bit of understanding so that ministers could, uh, could go and attend to something that was vital in the UK's interest. I'm not aware that anything has been genuinely prevented uh, if that had been the circumstance, but it's uh, it, it's helpful that the committee is aware of it. I think select committees are having the same issues, yep. um, and it's a bit odd if the Foreign Affairs Committee can never actually be anywhere foreign. No, as you have um, a nice balance, that ought to be. <laughs> there yeah, ought to be. It doesn't, no, it doesn't make any difference, but I just wonder whether, because one of the things that Parliament could do, which other Parliaments have done, is that they have committee weeks, which are weeks when there will not be votes. And I just wonder whether that be a, a means of... Um, this is this is uh, beyond the uh, uh, the room of the office. Um, You've survived. I do, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> again, I I welcome I welcome anything that makes it easier for us and our officials to do the job that we need to do. And if we need to go to certain places at key times, then uh, I hope we're able to do it one way or another. If there were set committee weeks that were made it easy for people to be abroad, of course, we use half terms and recesses for that. And we, we always assume, ministers assume, that if there is a break in the parliamentary proceedings for a recess, 
we don't stop. You know, we, we, we use that. We always use that as travel time. So the easier it is in term time to do that, that's fine. But the house has its pressures, particularly at the moment, and, and we understand that. No further. No. Thank. I'm sorry if I'm part of this. <coughs> My knowledge was was less no, no, complete no. than I wanted to be. We will go over the record and make sure that in places where I don't feel there was a, a, a sufficient response that we write to you just no, that you're covered. Exactly what I was going to ask. So thank you very much for the offer. We're extremely grateful for your time yeah. uh, okay. and we're extremely grateful for the frankness with which you answered both of you as well. So thank you very much. Order, order. We're now going to go into private session. So thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.